Hello, and welcome to Presenting, a podcast where we chat about various topics related to role-playing games, typically Paizo products such as Pathfinder and Starfinder, but also others. I'm John Godek, and with me today is Nate Wright. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's, you know, it's great to finally talk to you in person. I mean, even though we're online, I've, I've chatted with you on Discord, but we have not, not really ever conversed. So this is kind of a kind of a neat, one of the neat things I like about this is I get a chance to meet people and, and uh, that I normally wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see cast members face to face, get a better sense of it instead of just, oh, yeah, I sometimes do stuff for these people and they exist as Discord names and avatars. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Well, Nate is the author of the Eldritch Excursion blog on our network, the No Direction Network, as well as an active RPG freelance author. His credits include the, oh, I'm going to say this wrong again. Um, how do I say this? Anadi. Anadi, Anadi. I hear that all the time, and it, <laughs> for some reason I don't want to say that. So the Anadi ancestry in the Mwangi Expanse, uh, Monsters for the Starfinder Adventure Path, Attack of the Swarm books, four and six and co-authoring Pathfinder Society scenario 3-03 Echoes of Desperation. Nate claims to have a fondness for unusual and sometimes aberrant player options, citing the third edition Savage Species book as one of his all-time favorites. Um, what does that actually mean when you say you 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 like these kind of crazy player options? Can you give some specific examples of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been playing the game for a while now. You know, I started with a D&D third edition, and, you know, everyone starts with the basic self-insert human or a Lord of the Rings yeah. fan character. But then I played it for a while, experimented, played some World of Darkness, which is a whole different feel. And just bringing some of that into the game where it's like the premise is that you're a monster or you're weird right. or you don't entirely fit in. And sitting that next to like an elven ranger or a dwarven right. wizard, just no, nah, no, nah, it's it's fun. <laughs> but there, there's something cool about playing like a sentient ooze that someone carries you around right. in a barrel right. with. Mm. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot more options now in second edition, especially with the. The Book of the Dead, too, right? Have, have oh, you yeah. looked through that at all? Oh, I have, and I've already got a backup pl character planned for the home game I'm in right now. Mm -hmm, It'll mm -hmm. be pretty fun. It's uh, Basically, it's dragons aren't an ancestry in the game officially, though. There's a nice third-party right. thing. So what I was going to do, make a beastly skeleton, take the feat that essentially gives you the adopted feature, Pick it mm -hmm. with kobolds, so I can take kobold feats. The <laughs> yeah, idea is okay. they're a skeleton yeah. dragon, and they're kind right. of rebuilding what they used to be. And the kobold disguise is kind of the way he can make himself look like a humanoid with like kind right. of a Cubone from Pokemon look, like like he's right, wearing right, his right. own skeleton as an outfit. And then I just take yeah. dra Draconic Sorcerer, essentially relearning what it used to mean to be a dragon. Mm -hmm. That'll mm -hmm. be fun. Yeah, I know. You know, I know a lot of people that um, that like the kobold uh, ancestry and you know playing as a as a mini dragon kind mm -hmm. of thing. So that, mm -hmm. that's a really that's kind of a cool cool twist on it. So can you talk a little bit about the blog you write for No Direction, the Eldritch Excursion, kind of the inspiration on that, and you know from week to week because you're uh, regularly putting something together for it. Oh yeah, that one's just an expression of hey. Pathfinder should have more weird stuff. Starfinder should have mm -hmm. more weird stuff. So let me just make the game more weird. So, you know, I the, the pitch is that I look at the intersections of flavor and mechanics, because it's often when those things come together, they make some really nice features. When you got mm -hmm. a character mm -hmm. that feels like they're the thing you're describing as, that's where some of the best moments come from, at least for right, me. Right, right. So... Couple that with my interest in the weirdness, and I think, okay, what does it mean to play as a heretic in the eyes of your religion? Here's a background rule for that. Uh, what does it mean when you're playing a summoner, my favorite class? Uh, what does it mean to have your relationship with the Eidolon? Here's a little extra type of Eidolon that I've always wanted to have in the game. You know, a little, <laughs> little flavor, a little something extra. Just mm -hmm. generally using it as a place to experiment with ideas that I've had in my head, but I don't want to come into a whole book or that I just think I, I really want to share and I don't want to go through all the technical issues of getting it licensed or pitching it or whatever. Just things I Neat. want to exist. 
Yeah, yeah. So have you thought about making a, a compilation of that down the road, though? You know, once you got a couple years worth and and then maybe refining some of those rules and putting it out. Well, some of these ideas are like smaller bits. Like if you look back right. on some recent entries, I dedicated three blogs to the basic foundation of like a Psychonauts Inception style dream combat campaign. And that just mm -hmm. covers the very basics that you might see in like the first book if it were an adventure path. So, right. you know, maybe right. I might take that theme and write something in the future or maybe I'll take a ancestry option I like and say, hey, what if they had a town? Let's make a little book where it's just a little flavor book where here's the town, here's some stats to play as the thing in the town, some new items and monsters that might be in the town, and you can just surgically graft that into your campaign. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit how you got started as a freelancer and then how that kind of led to you join us here on the network? Well, I got started when I went to SkullCon, which is a local convention here in the Twin Cities. We actually have a pretty solid tabletop RPG scene here. So I got involved with that through Pathfinder Society. Then Thurston Hillman came in. That was pretty fun to meet him. And then I just one time worked up the courage to ask if they were looking for new authors. So he got me in touch with someone in Legendary Games, I did a mm -hmm. thing for them, and then he came to me with an offer to work with something in Paizo, and then I just got my foot in the door, and I've been dabbling with them ever since. Yeah, I I really like SkullCon a lot. I went, dude, I think it was 2019, the last one, before the pandemic, I think it is. Went in the, the before year. times. In the before time. It was the first time I'd gone. I'd heard great things about it. Um, I met Hillary there, and actually my my first interview for this series was with Hillary, followed by Thirsty, at that uh, convention. I I was doing uh -huh. them live because I I figured I was meeting these people. I might as well record these meetings. Oh, no. That's kind of how it got we, started. We might have brushed past each other, but I didn't know who you were at the time, and I was a nobody, so it is well, what it I, is. I didn't – I you know, I actually think I may have run into you and I think you may have sat down at my table, started the play, and then realized you were at the wrong table. <laughs> that that sounds like something I do. So I, I think now again, I don't remember names very well, but you look as soon as I saw so this is the first time I've ever seen you, like today, and I'm thinking, man, you look really familiar. And I was trying to figure out where it was from. Uh, and I had you authored anything at that point? Uh, back then. Ooh, that's a good, I'd have to look at a timeline, but it's possible I did like one of my really small first things. I think I want to say the first thing I did for Paizo was the two monsters in uh, mm -hmm. the Swarm event, Attack of the Swarm. That's the first thing I remember. Or maybe yeah, Starfinder? I think that... Yeah, that was Starfinder. Okay. Hmm. So I, I think it was you then, because I think, I think we talked about that. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I definitely brag about that, especially <laughs> if it was recent. I'd be, I'm always very yeah. giddy about something yeah. when I finish it or when it's out. Yeah, but I get yeah. to actually talk about it when it's out, which is nice. Well, when I, you know, when I started um, doing interviews, one of the reasons why I did it was I was trying to figure out how to break into writing because I hadn't written anything mm. since then. I've written quite a bit for Paizo and other. And uh, it was uh, kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to Hillary. She was kind of getting involved and in, in doing things and talking to Thirsty to kind of figure it out. And so that that's why kind of the nature of my questions always touch upon how did you get started? <laughs> what advice do you have for people? Because mm. not only do I think people are interested in seeing the differences that people might have, but I, I'm genuinely curious. That's kind of where those things came from. Yeah, well, I can I can say, like, if anyone wants to get in, go to places where there are people who are in the industry and introduce yeah. yourself. Networking is so, so much of it. Like, I, I went from mm -hmm. not knowing where these magic books came from or how they were made. <laughs> maybe they had yeah. elves. Maybe they contracted yeah. eldritch beings. And then I actually met people and got involved in the process. And, yeah, 
That's the biggest thing. Maybe have a portfolio, but I got a little lucky. They gave me a chance on a small project. Well, and and that seems to be somewhat common that uh, the folks at Paizo have certain things that they set aside for if there's somebody who's interested and I want to give them a shot, here's something I can do. It's kind of a low risk situation for them Smart. and it gives somebody a chance to, to kind of show what they know. Can they deliver something on time in the proper format and have something that's interesting and different, you know? So, yeah. Now, now how did you end up getting on no direction on the network? You know, I had just been kind of lurking in the community, like in the alleyways from time to time. I <laughs> stumbled upon the website through the greater yeah. Pathfinder community, saw some articles, occasionally commented. I'd even stop and think, oh, man, what would I write if I were on there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, eventually I got invited into a game with some people mm -hmm. in the network. Mm -hmm. It didn't go through, but they actually invited me to join, which is uh, still kind of crazy that I'm on this website that I've been following for several years. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's changed, you know, a little bit more recently, you know, with Perry oh, yeah. stepping down and Ryan not being as involved on kind of the flagship shows and things, but you know, it's, I think it's part of the organic growth and change that you see in a lot of programs, a lot of podcasts or blog sites and, and things like that. But yeah, now I'm wondering, uh, was the game you were invited to, was that going to be like a, uh, uh, second edition kind of, uh, newbie game or is it going to be something yeah, different? I, yeah. Ryan had invited me to a, yeah. to a short term game. Like a month. I think it was going to be a recorded thing. It wasn't going to yeah. be live. They just do it recorded, put it out as content, right. but it wasn't able to go through. Must've been something on the back end. I didn't really, pester him about mm -hmm. it i was way too worried about sounding annoying because it's like oh my god opportunity they're letting me in. my foot's getting in a door don't mess it up don't mess it up don't mess yeah. it up well because i seem to recall when that was happening and i told him i so i don't play a lot of uh second edition i i, mm -hmm. I didn't then now i've been playing a, a bit more and i remember when he was at i told him i would be very interested but the timing wasn't going to work for me mm -hmm. because of the shows and, and other things i was doing Mm -hmm. um, so I was disappointed. And then it just occurred to me when you mentioned that, that I don't recall it going through. So that's why I was thinking maybe, maybe it was that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's a shame, but it is what it is. I made it here. So, you know, yeah, maybe they no, were I, testing I me great. to see if, all right, he seems nice. <laughs> no. Let's play a game to make sure it isn't just like an act. Are we letting some screeching madman onto our show? And the answer is yes, but I know how to keep it under wraps. <laughs> Um, you know, that's funny. I actually approached them about getting on the network when, when, when I joined and they had a test and I forgot what it's called. It was like the, the something goose test. And I don't even remember mm. what it was. They asked me some question. I had to make the right answer. It was basically to show you weren't a racist bigot kind of thing. Mm. And we're going to be completely against everything the the show st stands for, I think. But, um, so I don't know that the bar is super high in that if you're w wanting to, to put on content for the network, I think we're happy to have you. So, um, so I think it's great that you're here and that you're doing stuff, but I, I, I don't think you needed to be worried. Uh, I think you, you know, the fact that they contacted you in the first place <laughs> meant they, that you'd already kind of met that threshold. So, well, that's my secret captain. I'm always worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, you've written both for Second Edition and Starfinder. Uh, do you play both of those? Actively? Oh, yes. I even wrote just a little bit for First Edition. I got in yeah, just yeah. in the nick of time. I wrote a, the, uh, oh, God, the last quest for Pathfinder Society First Edition. Uh, not Eyes of the Ten, but, oh, mm -hmm. God, this is bad. It, it was one revolving around the Decemberate, and I wrote the part with the dwarves, and it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, it was pretty fun writing it, at least. I'll let other so, people judge whether or not it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the, the differences you find when you're writing for the various systems and kind of what challenges do they present for you? Well, second edition was interesting 
because it was so different from First Dead. Like, I, I'd played First Dead ever since, what, I five, six years before the release of 2E. I had been in it for a while, and I was very much getting into the... I like doing optimization stuff, and even if I don't build the strongest character, I try to, like, know the system, mostly so I don't accidentally make a useless sack of crap, so... Which was, a unfortunately, a thing you could do in First Dead if you weren't careful. Right. So I was familiar with the rules, and, you know, it was kind of familiar if awkward territory at times. It's a very... People call it bloated, but I call it well-aged, full, ripe, voluminous. <laughs> But at the same time, also kind of bloated. And a now, second edition was smoother. Starfinder yeah. was my favorite system to write for, actually. Yeah. It has it has the feel of first edition Pathfinder, right. but some of the edges were smoothed out. Like the numbers are on a more steady track. It's harder to right. break the game. There's the the fact that they have a template for making monsters. Here it's mm -hmm. expected stats based on its level, its role, and its creature type is just that basic foundation means you don't have to spend all this time poring over stats of every similar CR and type of creature to like try to triangulate exactly where the numbers should be, maybe consult some tea leaves, check your horoscope, <laughs> make an animal yeah, sacrifice. Yeah. yeah, I think the math on, on Starfinder is pretty good. But not compared. Second edition is so tight, mm. so tight the way they they've gotten that, and they they work really hard at maintaining that. It seems like um, I, I'm I'm in terms of writing for both. What kind of challenges are there for you? Now it seems that you mentioned like really crazy, weird stuff. It seems like Starfinder would be like right up your alley for doing things like that, especially in the player options. You know the funny thing about that is when I first saw the system. I, I really liked it, and I still do, but then I saw, wait, if all of the aliens are just a thing, then how do I make something really weird? So, actually, what my one of my favorite things I've ever written was uh, the Mimetic Zenith monster for the final Swarm book. I'm sad it didn't get put in there, but I kind of understand like the theme. It wasn't going to quite fit, but I was given free reign, and I made use of it. It's a mm -hmm. CR-15 caster, which alone means I'll probably never see it for a while. But I'm a big fan of memes, meme culture, all the in-jokes, all those references. Mm -hmm. It's great. And you'd think in a place like Starfinder, that'd be even more all over the place. Tech is exploded. The Sheeran alone, yeah. with their obsession on self-expression and collective mm -hmm. cooperation, seems like mm -hmm. the perfect breeding ground for the tankest memes. Like, mm -hmm. there's Sheeran culture, and then everybody else. And then people who don't pay attention to it. But it, it understandably, they're not going to make that a laser focus in Pathfinder. I, I don't think we're going to see a ultimate Reddit or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I figured, hey, Akashic Record data exists, memes exist... And we've seen through things like the GameStop stocks or just various websites that become infamous, memes can be incredibly powerful. So mm -hmm. why couldn't memes in a magical world be so powerful that they manifest in a way that requires you to destroy their internet incarnation to put them down for good? And that's, that's what I put together, and I'm happier that it exists in the world. No, that... I actually have to go look that up. That sounds really, really cool. And oh, it's pretty fun. I, I'm actually playing a character that just hit 16th level, uh, and it's in an AP. Um, but you know, in society play, they're going to have, I think, uh, 515 is going to be a, an 11 to 14. Ooh, so you could see nice. something like that. And I don't know if that's written or not yet. So I, I think it's far enough out that maybe it. It's in the process of, um, but yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds like a really, really, really cool thing. And I, and, uh, I'm, where is that right now? Is it in, it's in, in the, the, uh, alien archive, archive of, uh, well, you know how the adventure paths have the own little oh, alien in the toolbox. Yeah. It's yeah. In the toolbox. The toolbox. Okay. It's in the okay. sixth swarm book as a okay. CR 15 thing. You can throw at your players. 
Okay. And because there's variable as the memes that exist, you could you could make it so if you're fighting the Vescarium, right? You're, you're running a home yeah. game where you're either freeing the Vescarium or even playing as them and like conquering one of the planets in like a flashback. You could make right. it so the very will of the people to either win the war through defense or conquest is made manifest. The propaganda, the emotions, right, the right, right, right. trillions of you know, troll posts that follow in the cultural fallout, all made manifest in this spirit bomb of a creature. It's right, right. Call me biased because I very much am, but I feel like it's the kind of monster that can serve as the centerpiece of an entire campaign, mm -hmm. as a as a literal idea made manifest. I think there's potential in there. To be the big boss is causing lots of yeah. problems all throughout. Then you finally see where it's all coming from. Or even the thing that gets out of control when the big boss yeah. like tries too hard. Classic <laughs> tapped into power you couldn't yeah. control kind of yeah. trope. Nice. I, I will. I def, I'm going to check that out right actually after this. Actually. Oh, cool, cool. So, so what advice do you have for people interested in getting involved in freelance writing and blogging? Well, again, I got kind of lucky through proximity. So networking is the number one thing. Okay. Like knowing people. I thought you were going to say be really lucky. I wasn't sure. So. I mean, <laughs> yes, in all things in life, especially. But yeah. of course, other than that, just do things like be being known, like get to know people. If, if you have a favorite class or a favorite style that you like to go about with things, hmm. like I like weird stuff. I will always defend the summoner class as the perfect child who did nothing mm -hmm. wrong, including the APG, fight me. <laughs> but, you know, just have a bit of an identity, have a name, talk to people. Mm -hmm. Pretty much give yourself every advantage you can to make people think of you. Hey, we're looking to expand our roster. Hey, isn't there that guy that invented the fighter that could fly by fifth level and everyone made memes about wing sword the backbreaker i don't know <laughs> you know just be involved yeah. uh be a good boy don't don't do anything that would bite you in the butt um yeah and just now, put stuff out there so you met folks at SkullCon. do you go to other big conventions as well or is that kind of uh, your primary there are some other smaller conventions i've been to a few paizo cons and they were pretty good back in the before times. Yes, I was making yes. it a regular thing. Then 2020 got closed down. 2021 didn't happen. And 2022 happened, but to the best of my knowledge, like they were honoring the 2020 tickets. And that essentially pre-filled up the amount of people they were going to let in. And I think right. there might have been some wiggle room, but it was tight enough that I didn't want to bother like booking a flight in a hotel room. For sure. Right. 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 So I'm looking forward to twenty twenty three unless something happens. Wouldn't put it past the world, but you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping as well. I I had tickets from twenty twenty that carried over, but I have a, I had a kidney transplant two years ago and I can't mm -hmm. still go out to do things in public and I'm hoping by next Isocon. I'm actually hoping by Gen Con, but I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I'll find out more next week. But I love Pizacon. That's Pizacon, Origins, and Skullcon. If I were to say kind of three, um, you know, a couple bigger one and one smaller, more intimate one, I think those are, you know, those are my favorites. And I, I've gone to eight or nine around the country, and those are the ones I enjoyed quite a bit the most. And the timing where they're spread out is it's pretty good as well in general where Skullcon normally falls later in. in yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they made specifically sure to plan it when other people could go to right. make sure it wouldn't crowd out anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's nice that like that's close enough for thirsty to come down. Is he a regular there? I just saw him the one time. Yeah, he was a he's a semi regular. We'd we'd always lure him over by offering him gift baskets of booze. <laughs> yes. Skullcon was a very social con and some people yes. had a lot of fun and were very social. Yeah, uh, well Jack the next one. Jack had a, a big get together at his house where, where a lot of us out of town uh, mm. folks got invited over and Thirsty was there and and that was really kind of cool. 
I really, I kind of enjoy that quite a bit. So Nate, what's next for you? What kind of cool things are you working on that you can actually talk about with us today? Um, well, I'm between projects right now in terms of like freelance work, but I am working on a few like smaller things right now. Uh, nothing worth like showing up or getting too many promises up, but <laughs> let's just say I've got a little story arc going on in my uh, Eldritch Excursion blogs where I occasionally mm -hmm. attempt to seize the means of evolution from Oros the god of evolution. Mm -hmm. right, right. And I actually have something of a conclusion to the arc planned in the future that I think will be pretty cool. Very early in development, but I'm looking forward to that. Other than that, you can definitely expect more stuff from the blog. I might expand on some of them later as books to sell, maybe even a thing or two to hand out, because, again, I always like getting my name out there and I just right. want these things to exist and be played in games. That's the most flattering thing I could hear. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I like that thing. It happened in the game and we had a good time. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I look forward to seeing more from you and hopefully see more uh, freelance work from you down the road as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm Nate, not going thanks anywhere. so much. Yep. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a good time.